Today, the sermon is very simple. It's actually a one major thought sermon. And that is, God has invited you to be in His presence. God has invited you to share with Him your deepest thoughts. God has invited you into a relationship. God has invited you into that privilege of being able to see Him as He really is and not what someone else says that He is. So often, like we have said from this pulpit, you can know a lot about a person, but unless you have actually met that person face to face, you cannot claim a personal relationship with that person. I want to talk about the open door. And this really has to do with a thought that was shared by the author of the book of Hebrews. That in the past, there was no way the, the old ancient believers during Moses' time, Abraham's time, and even King David, they never had this privilege of being able to enter into the Holy of Holies and catch a glimpse of the glory of God. But he says, by a new and living way, each and every one of us New Testament believers, saved by the blood of Jesus, can actually come and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Pastor Chris led us in singing this, when I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness. Church, that doesn't have to be just a song. That can become the story of your life. For you to tell your neighbor, I saw the Lord's glory. I beheld the Lord's glory. I heard him say something to me. You know, he touched me and I was healed. God has always desired for mankind to have fellowship with him. God has always wanted that. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, we read this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, Where are you? Those familiar with the Bible will know this is an account that was um, describing what happened after Adam and Eve had sinned. God had created them, and God had spent much time in fellowship with them. God wanted to show them the extent of His love for them, and his care for them. But they decided to go their own way. And when they disobeyed God, guilt became a big hindrance between them and God. I've shared a story from the pulpit before about how as a young child, I learned how guilt really breaks relationships with our parents. If you remember, I talked about how I had this big-time desire to be a novelist, a story writer, an author. And the house was my dad's typewriter, which I was not supposed to touch, but I knew way because I wanted to be like Enid Blyton, I wanted to be like Franklin Dixon, and wanted to write stories like, like the Hardy Boys and stuff like that. I decided that I wanted to have a manuscript typed. But anyway... Me being me. Three minutes into using that forbidden typewriter, I managed to get the ribbon entangled in all the keys. And I think I snapped the ribbon. Knowing very well that this was a typewriter that both my parents used for their work, I knew I was going to be in deep, deep trouble. That evening when they came home, I didn't neglect going to meet them. But I tell you, I went with such an artificial smile because I was just wrecked with guilt and wondering why I was so stupid. And Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, really didn't feel like meeting God again. But the question that God asked Adam and Eve is a question that he asks you and I. Where are you? Where are you? 
Long ago, I heard the story about how it's a fictionalized story. I mean, it's fiction, of course. But how someone made a covenant with God, made a promise that he would meet God every single morning. He would meet God at 7 o'clock or meet Jesus at 7 o'clock and chat with Jesus and have a devotion with him. He kept this appointment for quite some weeks. But one day, because of some kind of uh, emergency, he missed that and after that, just let it slip. Story only, huh? But one day, he suddenly realized, oh, I always said that I'll meet Jesus at 7 o'clock and it's always in this particular place in the home. And he opened the door and he found Jesus was there. Story, huh? but spiritual truth is important. And he said to Jesus, what are you doing there? Jesus said, have you forgotten? I made an appointment with you and you made an appointment with me. I've kept that appointment every single day. And I guess he asked the same question that God asked Adam and Eve. But where are you? Where were you? And all through the Bible, you will see the yearning of God and the desire of God to have more than just a creator-creature relationship. It was always a God who wanted to have that intimacy with God's people. So we find in the book of Genesis that intimacy was cut off. But despite mankind's disobedience, God still loved them dearly. God instituted many, many different ways where they could come close to Him. And one of the early men whom God revealed His desire to have intimacy was, with was Abraham. And senior pastor brought it up so beautifully last week. When he talked about Abraham's faith and Abraham's obedience, that really brought Abraham to a new understanding of God. In the Genesis chapter 22, which we read last week, and I just want to read that again. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 to 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of the enemies and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Little did Father Abraham know, little did Father Abraham know that the manner in which God would use him and his descendants was to mend the rift that had taken place when Adam and Eve sinned. Because if you look at the genealogies of Jesus, which were given in the Gospels, and you read the one in Matthew, you see that Matthew traced Jesus' genealogy right back to Father Abraham, the, the Messiah, the descendant of Jesus, the, the descendant of um, Abraham was the one who brought us all back. And this is the greatest blessing, friends. I don't know what you consider the greatest blessing in your whole life. I don't know what is most valuable in your life. Which is the relationship that matters most? Is it your relationship with the Lord? And if you say it is the relationship with the Lord, then how then should we live? Time went on, and after Abraham, God continued to reveal to his people his desire to want to draw close to them. He raised up Moses to take the people out of Egypt. And when they went to the wilderness, God continued to let them know that he desired to dwell and to fellowship with his people. And in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, we read this. God says, to Moses, have then, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I made you. Let me pause for one moment. 
You know, when God gave us the series of miracles so that CCC could be completed, it wasn't that we had a trophy to show the nation that we had won some kind of a legal battle. God told senior pastor, build a sanctuary for me. This place has been dedicated and will always be dedicated as a meeting place between God and man. And I say each time as you come into the sanctuary, our sanctuary, this beautiful auditorium that God's given to us, be very aware that this has been consecrated and dedicated and set apart as a meeting place between you and God. And that as you come every Sunday, you're not just coming because you're wanting to fulfill a religious activity. Build me a tabernacle, God said, that I may dwell among them. You know, the layout of the tabernacle and the furnishings reveal God's nature. And I've asked communications, asked Jason to just give us a picture of the tabernacle because so many of us read about it in the Bible, but we really don't know what it looks like. This is a model of the tabernacle. Looks like some uh, Lego set type thing. But look at how intricate the design was. If you read the book of Exodus, God actually tells them how many poles there are to surround the tabernacle. He told them how to weave the fabric that was to cover the tabernacle. The actual tabernacle is that structure at the back of your picture or at the back of that picture where you see there is something like a mold skin that covers the top of the tabernacle. It shows how you're supposed to enter the courts of God and then you come to the brazen, you come to the altar of burnt offering, then you come to the basin where the priests would also examine themselves before they entered into the holy place and then the holy of holies. God said, build me a tabernacle. And he used that tabernacle to illustrate how we could get back into an intimate relationship with him. Can I have the next slide? This is the layout of the tabernacle. I'll take just three to four minutes. This is not the main part of the, ser of the sermon. But it's a preparation and you need to know that. God was so very, very much wanting to have man draw near to him. And he gave them a very intricate design. If you look towards the right-hand side of the drawing, you see a black arrow. That arrow is the entrance. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. And then you would go into the outer courtyard. I will enter his courts with praise. And in the courtyard, first of all, you see the altar of burnt offering. Any Israelite who wanted to come and maintain a relationship with God knew that he had sinned and would bring an offering. If he had sinned, he would bring a sin offering. He would bring a lamb. He would bring an ox. He would bring a bird if he was very, very poor. And if he was very, very, very poor, he could even bring flour. Church, God provides for us that we might be able to draw near to him. And when the offerer brought the animal sacrifice to the priest, it was not the priest that killed the animal. It was the one who brought the animal who had the responsibility of killing the animal. Why? Because God wanted the one who brought the sacrifice to know that an animal was dying on his behalf. That life had to be paid for sin. The animal would be sacrificed on the altar. The priest did that. Then the priest would make sure that they kept themselves clean because they were ministering before the Lord. And every once in a while, groups of priests were allowed to enter into what we call the holy place. There are three things in the holy place. At the top part, you see, there is a table of showbread. 
It was a table where there were 12 loaves of bread always there because it was to remind the people that God was their provider. There were 12 loaves of, well, I say loaves, you, you start thinking of our sandwich loaves. No, they look more like chapati because it was unleavened bread. It's two stacks of six pieces of chapati or, or some kind of a, a, a pita bread type thing. Twelve, because there were twelve tribes. Unleavened bread, because it is without sin. And a constant reminder that God's people are always provided for. Principle that never changes. God provides for His people. Then, at the bottom, you see what is called the menorah. This is the seven-armed lampstand, reminding us that God, Jesus, is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread of life. And there's the altar of incense which burns 24 hours a day. The, it symbolized the worship and praise. That praise and worship was continually before the Lord. And it also remind us, reminds us of Jesus, the great intercessor. Actually, when you look at this, this particular tabernacle, it shows that Jesus is our offering. Jesus is the one who cleanses us by his blood. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus ever lives to make intercession. And then... Once a year, once a year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would bring a sacrifice and enter into the Holy of Holies where he would behold the Shekinah glory of God. Many of you know how on that day there was a sacred assembly and everybody would come because the high priest was bringing the whole nation of Israel before God. And only he saw the glory of God. There was a curtain that prevented anybody else from going from the holy place to the holy of holies. No matter how much the people wanted to encounter God themselves, they could not. Can I have the final slide? This is what the different pieces of furniture look like before I move on. The table of, uh, let's go from the top left. The altar of burnt offerings. You see the four horns there. They talked about the authority of God. See the bronze laver. It's really just a basin with water that allows you to look at what you look like and then to wash. See the table of showbread where constantly we're reminded that God is our provider. See the golden lampstand, specially designed, intricate, so that we are reminded that Jesus is light. The altar of incense, on which incense burned, and then the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says that in that Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the law that was given to Moses. There was Aaron's rod, and there was a small bowl of manna. These were three signs of the covenant that God made with his people. And there were two angels at the top. And it is said, between those two wings, God met his people. This is the Old Testament foretaste of the work of Jesus. When Abraham sacrificed his son, his son was spared because a lamb was caught in the thickets. You and I today are spared because the Lamb of God, given by God himself, at Calvary, took our place. All this changed at Jesus' death and resurrection. Everything changed because by a new and a living way, a new door has been opened to all of us to enter into the presence of God. And I bring this thought to you to tell you that it is God who initiated our relationship with Him. You know, in our own hum human sinfulness, none of us, none of us really would want to reach out to God. But the Bible tells us, and Jesus tells us, that we landed up being God's children because in this mysterious way, God called out to you, I once was lost, but now am found. 
I don't understand all the theological things behind it, but I know I was lost and God found me. Even though I like to say, I found God. And because God reached out to you and God saved you, today He is saying, where are you? I'm here. I'm accessible to you. How did God make Himself accessible to us? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 21 says this. Hebrews 10, 19 to 21. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, the invitation is, let us draw near to God. This morning, I'm just going to share with you, let us. Let us, the author of the Hebrew says, don't miss out on the best that God has for you. Let us enter in. Invitation has been given. Door has been opened. Feast has been prepared. It's not necessarily food. It's the beautiful, wonderful presence of God. Come in, the Lord says. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 continues to say, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with water. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But we know it was meant for all those Jews who had found Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour and who once upon a time could not come near to God themselves, never saw the Shekinah glory of God, always just had a second-hand experience. But the author of the Hebrews says, since Jesus came, all that has changed. Jesus, our great high priest, went up to heaven, offered himself as that sacrifice, and once and for all, the curtain at the temple was torn open. You no longer need an intermediary. Jesus is the only intermediary that we need to come into the presence of God and to receive from God. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, Paul tells Timothy. This is the man Christ Jesus. I'm blessed to be in a church when I'm reminded from the pulpit so often it's by grace and grace alone and not by works, lest anyone should boast. God is the initiator of it all. Amen. Today, I want to invite you in a few moments to accept this invitation. The people whom the author was writing this letter to were living in a time where they were under great stress and great persecution. Because they had become Christians, they were ostracized by their fellow Jews. Because they were Christians, the government persecuted them because there were rumors that Christians were trying to put a new emperor in the place of the Caesars. Because they were Christians, their families neglected them and chucked them aside because they said they were now rebels. Because they were Christians, some of them lost their jobs. Some of them lost their credentials with trades unions. Because during that time, if you were a carpenter, you had a carpenter's kind of a, a, a accreditation body. If you were a businessman, a banker, you had a banker's association. And in each of these associations had their own patron gods. And when bankers turned to Jesus and tradesmen turned to Jesus, they refused to go participate in rituals. And as a result of that, many of them were under great duress and great stress. 
And the author of the book of Hebrews writes to them and says to you, you remember in the Old Testament? You remember how God wanted to draw near? Then he took them all the way through in the first 10 chapters of Hebrews and tells them, listen, all that God was doing was to come to this point to tell you, in the midst of all your hardships, draw near to God. Because the curtain has once and for all been torn. You have an open door to the Lord. And as a result of this new relationship, there are 14 let us. All the way from Hebrews chapter 4 to Hebrews 13, 14, 15. You can go back and read it. But I've just picked a few before we open the altars and invite you into the open door of God's blessing. Not by the works you have done. So wonderfully shared with us. By grace. Because of God's initiation. Because of God's love for us. I remember Pastor David, I think it was, who shared about how Billy Graham's daughter, who had lived a life that was far from what her father desired, when she had failed him over and over again and brought his credibility into question by some people who chose to criticize, when she came back to father's house, a failed marriage, Father never said anything except to open his arms and say, I love you. Sure, there needed to be forgiveness. Sure, there needed to be a making right. But it all began with going through the open door. As we close, let me just read you a couple of letters. Let us hold unswervingly to hope. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who has promised is faithful. The author to the Hebrews said, you know, all that we're enjoying today just validates and authenticates God's declaration that he is a promise, covenant-keeping God. Then he says, let us encourage and spur each other to love. Because they were going through such hard times. Sometimes some of them tended to forget the privileges that they had. Church at every life group meeting, at every youth meeting, at every children's church meeting or children's ministry meeting, may we continue to spur each other to know the kind of a hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the good works He has created us to do. He says, let us encourage and spur each other to love. Consider how we may spur each other. You know, that spur is that star-like thing at the back of the uh, boot of a cowboy. And the cowboy, if you've ever watched any of these westerns, would use that spur to make the horse go faster. It's literally to give that person a prod. Every once in a while, you need to do that to the person next to you. If you're asleep right now, will you do it? Just give them a poke and provoke them to good works. <laughs> no, but figuratively and really um, practically, let us encourage each other. Let's go on. Let's be intentional and persevere in our Christian life, no matter how difficult it is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, we are surrounded, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. We have had access to God. He will help us persevere. He will help us persevere. I hear a little child. That's one of the sweetest sounds of the world, isn't it? To hear a little baby gurgle. 
But you never know, the poor little baby, not the poor little baby, the baby doesn't know what life lies ahead for him or her. Because the baby is in church, I know the parents will help the baby run the race. And while we are running our race, because we have had access to the Lord, let's keep our focus on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we close this part. Those who have beheld God, worship God. Those who have encountered God, worship God. Those who have received from God, worship God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confess His name. So all these things have been set in place for us. Everything has been set in place for us. How come some of us are not enjoying that intimacy and that promise of blessings that God gives to us? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. Actually, the writer began with this, but I chose to end with this. This is the reason why Many of us fall short of the experience that God wants us to have. Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, what rest, what rest is the author talking about? Since the promise of shalom still stands. Shalom is a fantastic word. It's not an absence of war. It is not just, Hiya, thank God, now the music stopped already, now I've got some peace of mind. No, it's a sense of well-being, of wholeness, of completeness, of contentment, of deep joy. It is the understanding that this, that this life, difficult though it is, is a life of hope. It's a life where the impossible can be possible because a new and living way has been opened to us to the very throne room of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Yeah, we can fall short of it. We can come every Sunday just because wife insists we come or husband insists we come. Or for the sake of the children, we come. No, we come because we want to go through that open door to receive the great things that the Lord has for us. You see, because it goes on to say, we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. When Abraham obeyed, he encountered God. When Moses obeyed, he encountered God. When the woman at the well obeyed and sought forgiveness, she had a story to tell the people. When Jairus obeyed and had faith that Jesus could raise his daughter, the daughter came back to life. When the boy who had the five loaves and two fishes obeyed and had faith that Jesus could do something with what he gave, he went home and counted the Lord, and having encountered the Lord. Today, the open door is set before you. Will you enter to that open door? Eyes not seen, ears not heard, the wonderful things 
that God has in store for those who love Him. Today you love Him and He loves you. Will you stand with me at this time? And for a few moments, will you yourself speak to the Lord before I open the altars? Is there something that you need to bring to the Lord? For some of us, it is gratitude. It is coming with thanksgiving. It is saying to God, God, I don't want to neglect giving thanks to you. I want to offer a sacrifice of praise this morning, Lord. Many times I go to the altar, Father, because I'm seeking you for things. But this morning I'm coming to the altars because I want to bring the fruit of my lips, giving thanks to you, Lord. I enter in to give thanks. But there's some of you who do have a need. And the Father says, you come too. Because the door is open. And don't let the devil tell you you're not good enough. Because it is the blood of my Son that validates you. It is the blood of my Son that makes you worthy to come before my presence. Only by grace. Only by grace. Thanksgiving. A need for miracles. Maybe you are here. And to be honest, you come to church because it's required of you. But the truth be told, you come in here and you're bored stiff, which ought not to be. Because the Lord wants to reveal Himself to you. He wants to make Himself manifest in your life. If you want a greater revelation of God in your life, will you come? As Pastor Chris and the team sings, all it takes is one moment. All it takes is one touch Lay aside everything else I came for you. Can we have that song instead? Our Father, we come in great gratitude that you, your door is always open to us. The door of your heart remains open all the time. It's not dependent on whether we are good enough or not. Whether we earn it or not, it is your unconditional love. Even when we fail, your door is especially open so that we can come in again. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your great love and your invitation that is always open to us. And we come to you today. We come to you today and just as we are without one plea. But because of your great love and your great grace and your great mercy and your unconditional forgiveness, we come and we ask for your forgiveness, for your cleansing. We come into your heart and receive abundance of grace. The affirmation that we need for the sum this morning are here because they have felt so rejected. But your word has come to us. Your word has come to us so clearly that you will receive us with open arms. So Lord, we come. To you we come and we receive. We receive this morning from a heavenly Father who loves us, who loves us so abundantly. You know this morning, one of the first thoughts that came to my heart was, I was glad when they say to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And when I received that word and that quickening of, I was glad when they say unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Then the next thought came, why do we go, why are we glad? Why do we go to the house of the Lord? Then I saw a father God, a heavenly father, 
who is so delighted and so excited that his children, he saw all of you, that his children are coming to the house of the Lord and he has great gifts, abundance of gifts for every one of you today, for me as well. So whatever your need may be, our God is able and more than able to meet every need, to cleanse every sin, to forgive every sin, and to do the impossible. And when God opens the door, no man can shut. When God opens the door, no man can shut. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you. So now all of us just thank Him. Thank Him that He's going to open that great door for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for the, for the gift that you have prepared for us. Because you are our Father. And you see us as your children. And see, you see the challenges. And you see the difficulties. And you see the relationships that cannot be pen penetrated. But God, you are opening that door yes. and we will receive from you yes. and the miracle begins right now in the name of jesus hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. you are a miracle working god and we receive from you today yes. we go having received from you god our father and we want to thank you we are healed in the name of jesus Amen. we are healed spirit soul and body in the name of jesus Amen. hallelujah thank you lord thank you lord and once again we are reminded from your word this morning that the door is still open for us to share jesus yes. thank you lord for the freedom that we have today yes and we thank you lord that as we go this morning we go with a commitment and a dedication and a awareness and a passion that we will share Jesus Christ to the world that needs to know Jesus, to our world. Thank you for this open door where the gospel can be preached and still is being preached. Anoint us, anoint the Church of Jesus Christ. And this coming week, as we share Jesus, many will respond and come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. In Amen. Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.